and welcome to part three of our whiskey mentory about the secondary market on the neatly sponsored Whiskey Tension Podcast. I'm Scott. And I am Ed. And this, the final installment, will be casting some shade onto all those whom we feel are responsible for the causes and effects of the entire secondary market mess that we highlighted in the two preceding weeks. Including and, us. Yes. And then we try to figure out how we might be able to fix this mess, or even if it can be fixed at all. But before we get to all the recriminations and resolutions, Ed's here to recap for us what happened the last time we met here in part two. Thanks, Scott. In our first part, we introduced the three-tier system and the average way pricing are set at retail bars and liquor stores. Last week, we looked at scarcity and we talked to some players in the game. Anders, the uh, master mixologist and the bar manager from the local lounge, came in to talk about how bars are affected by scarcity allocation, the pandemic. Mm. Then Billy from Benash Liquors of Cherry Hill came in and talked about all those topics from a liquor store's point of view. We saw a big contrast in the pandemic between how bars suffered and liquor stores tend to flourish. And he talked about how, you know, he managed through the pandemic, but also how he deals with allocation and the three-tier system. And then we had Matt on, who works for a large national distributor and has also worked for a major producer. And he has a tremendous background in the industry. And so he also talked about how producers and distributors look at the three-tier system, manage and sometimes cause scarcity Mm -hmm. and um, through special releases and how allocations are decided. And we uh, continued our search for alternatives to hard to find whiskeys. The first part, we did Bell Mead's Reserve as a replacement for Kentucky Owl. Mm -hmm. For part two, we did Russell Reserve Single Barrel as a replacement for Blanton's. And we found that if you, being that it was a little bit hotter than Blanton's, proof it down with about seven, eight drops of distilled water. Take it down to right around mid-90s proof-wise, the flavor profile really favored Blanton's. So today we're going to look at, like Scott said, who's to blame Mm -hmm. and how can we fix it? Because I think that's the most important thing. I mean, I never liked people who just tell me the problem. Right, right. You know, if we're walking across the desert... Don't tell me you're hot unless you have some shade. You know what I mean? Like, just just bring your car door with you. And then when you get hot, just roll the window down. <laughs> so for us just to scream, be like, oh, there's not enough whiskey. It's a problem. And not come up with a solution. We think that's lame. So we're yeah, going to come up with, exactly. at the end, we're going to leave on a positive note. But first, we're going to talk about how shitty everything is. Let's do that first. Okay. Yes. Um, so I came across two blog entries that I think encapsulates uh, the whole thing that we've been talking about in the first two parts. And it leads us right into talking about who's to blame and uh, how we can fix it. Correct. So both of these are from uh, renowned whiskey writers. The first is uh, Chuck Cowdery and his uh, blog. Wait, Chuck Cowdery, wasn't he the guy on uh, the dating show? With, uh, with... <laughs> so, no, that's Chuck Woolery. Oh, Chuck Woolery, that's right. <laughs> what, what was that called? Matt, was it something like, not Matt, oh, a love connection. A love connection, yeah. Yeah, yeah. hell of a jaw, that guy. <laughs> he did. He, was a, he, had a, he had a big head. I wouldn't want to punch him. Right. Yeah. Or, or sometimes you kind of wanted to, but yeah. I wouldn't actually do it. because Yeah, it hurt, he was a swarmy motherfucker. Hurt my no offense to him if he's out there right. listening. If you're a fan, Chuck, send us a bottle. But <laughs> so honestly. <laughs> so anyway, Chuck Cowdery, the oh, whiskey right. writer. No not, relation, right? Not, no relation, because it's not the same name. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, Just the, checking. The same first name. All right. True. <laughs> Okay, so he had a blog entry called How Bad is the Worldwide Whiskey Shortage? Not so bad, actually. So it says in part this. Any report you see that says or gives the impression that we are, quote, running out of whiskey is wrong. We're not. There is a shortage affecting the trade, but only in that producers and distributors are unable to fill some orders for some products some of the time. For consumers, this shortage is having either no effect or they occasionally find stores out of something specific they want to buy. Part of the problem is that brands on allocation are allocated in part according to historic sales. As we talked about in part two, W.L. Weller is a good example. Texas, where Weller has always sold very well, gets a lot of the Weller that's available. Recently, people around the country have become aware of Weller as a pappy alternative. So they're trying to find it in markets where Weller has not historically been sold, which we also talked about regional scarcity. Retailers in those places who have customers asking for it can't get it from distributors because that city or state's small allocation sells out so fast. Similarly, there are some very small brands that have always been in short supply, but you didn't know because you've never looked for them before. As American whiskey drinkers become more knowledgeable and go looking for the in the know favorites, shelves can empty fast. Producers will adjust, but it may take several cycles. So, as a consumer, from time to time, you will go to the store intending to buy old frothing slosh <laughs> only to find them sold out. Maybe you'll go to another store and they'll be out of it too. The radical earth shattering solution, buy something else and come back in a month when old frothing slosh has been restocked. There you go. 
So the second blog entry that I found was from Fred Minnick, another famous whiskey author and podcaster. Yeah, from Jersey with us, right, from, Scott? Yeah, from Jersey. Fred, listen, let's let's do lunch. Big fans. A booby. Let's, yeah. let's up. <laughs> A boob. <laughs> let's do it honestly, Fred. Seriously, we should know. I'll, Fred, please call me. Yeah. He, he, I'm sure he's listening. <laughs> sure, why wouldn't he? <laughs> why wouldn't he, damn it? Well, I mean, honestly, you always say that, Scott. You have I, no idea who's I, listening to us. I, I would listen to us. True. I do listen to us, actually. Well, I do, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I listen to Fred, too. He's a, he's a talented guy. Yeah. So he had a blog entry uh, that he called Who's Responsible for $6,000 Pappy? So he starts with How would you like to buy something for 20 times what it cost three years ago? Thanks to demand, the three-tier system, and ultra-greedy retailers, that's what's happening with Pappy Van Winkle bourbons. I've personally seen Pappy Van Winkle 23-year-old sold for $5,000 and seen liquor store Facebook photos showing $6,000 price tags. MSRP is $79.99 for the 15-year-old, $119.99 for the 20-year-old, and $259.99 for the coveted 23-year-old expression. But good luck finding it at those prices, or really, good luck finding Pappy, period. On the lucky chance you do find Pappy, you're likely to see prices rivaling a used Honda. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so who's to blame for the price gouging? Well, there's a lot to go around. I was part of the 2013 San Francisco World Spirits Competition that declared Pappy Van Winkle, 15-year-old, the world's best bourbon. And I've certainly blabbed to anyone with an ear about Pappy Van Winkle's weeded bourbon merits, and I'm not the only one. From all the stories about what to buy other than Pappy, the media has built this Pappy story and then complained about the story going overboard. The rest of the Van Winkle line extensions benefit. In fact, all Buffalo Trace brands benefit from the Pappy Van Winkle attention. The number one replacement for Pappy Van Winkle is W.L. Weller, and guess who owns Weller? Buffalo Trace. In fact, every channel in the three-tier system is milking the Pappy phenomenon. Buffalo Trace has stronger negotiating power with distributors, while the wholesalers require retailers to purchase six cases of crap vodka for one bottle of Pappy Van Winkle 23-year-old. And then the retailer sets high prices to make up for the crap vodka expense. Is this illegal? Hell, I don't know. I'm sure there's a price gouging law somewhere that is intended to prevent consumers from spending 20 times a product's value. Then again, isn't a product's value whatever somebody is willing to spend? I don't know. What I do know is that every time I see a Pappy price tag, I feel a little dirty. (laughs) But this is the broken system we're stuck with that allows for $6,000 Pappy Van Winkle. Will it ever change? You spell will it. (laughs) <laughs> W-I-L-L-E-T. <laughs> so what I thought was really interesting about these two, which I found later in my research, mm-hmm. they're from 2013 and 2014. Nothing has fucking changed right. in eight, nine I mean, years. It's probably got a little bit worse because of the pandemic, but yeah. in some ways. Though, so wow. So you were reading those articles. I thought they came out this year when you were reading them. I would love to be at the San Francisco tasting uh, <laughs> event, but what a fucking troublemaker that is, right? Yeah. And the other troublemaker is a whiskey advocate who every time they name a whiskey of the year, you can never buy it the following year. I mean, I loved Larceny Barrel Proof. I, I would have told you Larceny Barrel Proof was a tremendous replacement for Pappy or even George T. Stagg maybe, but it's hard to say that now if you live in Jersey because good luck finding a bottle of that either. Right. Uh, so we have a different sections of society that are responsible for this mess, and we'll just go through them. Let's start blaming people, Scott. <laughs> okay. So um, the first one I have on our list are through the consumers of the past. Shame. Right. So this may include you out there. It, it did include us as well. The early 2000s surge in consumer demand, which, uh, you know, made everything scarce in the first place. Right. I don't think they knew what they were doing. Right. I mean, it wasn't and, purposeful. And I think that was just an economic twist where the demand grew quicker than the producers were expecting. And so they took them a while to get caught up because then we were fat with it from about 2005 to about 2012. Mm-hmm. I feel like everything was pretty plentiful and around yeah and about 10 years ago shit started to get real exactly because everything got uh, gobbled up by uh, thirsty drinkers um the next one is just the nature of whiskey itself shame i mean whiskey is hard to make it's hard to make good it takes a long time right so it's kind of ripe for a situation that we're seeing right now right when like when you see stuff go from 10 year nine year age statements to artfully aged it's because they're trying you know to cut their nine-year-old product with some five-year-old product to give us something that tastes pretty much like the 10 year or the nine year tasted and keep up with the demand yeah. and we complain about it and yet they're like dudes we're trying to give you fucking whiskey to drink like this yeah. is the best we can do right now we're, we're we, trying this shit's i can't go in the in the back and make you a 10-year bourbon you know right uh so the next one is facebook Shame. Shame. They were the one who created the forum for people to gather online and commit illegalities <laughs> uh, and being slow to crack down on them uh, because of the fear that people would no longer use their platform. So they were cynically allowing this to happen for profit. I mean, 
I think we all know that deep down, Facebook is the evil empire. Uh, they're, they're, I fucking hate Facebook. If we didn't have the podcast, I wouldn't be on it at all. Right. But there's some good parts of Facebook. I mean, I keep connected to my friends and I watch their kids grow up. Some people live in like different states. I can't see them a lot, but I feel like I'm connected to them. But it's a huge price to pay for all the anger and hate speech that came across the last couple of years and yeah. stuff that made it a place where I had to disengage from. Yeah. So, yeah, we promote our podcast on it. I have a 1,100 friends on there that like to communicate with me sometimes. Right. I like to get my birthday love. That's my favorite part of Facebook. <laughs> on my birthday, how many people can I get? Interesting. And this goes out to just my Facebook friends right now. Listen, 163 of you wish me happy birthday in January. Here it comes. 847 <laughs> of you did not wish me happy birthday. So I don't know what your fucking problem is, okay? Shame. You didn't even have the time to just, how about a little just an HB, you know what I mean? You like, needy bastard. <laughs> how, long, how long would it have taken you to just give me like a little how, like birthday cake emoji oh and just God. set it off? So 800 of you are really disappointing me because I'm sure that I said happy birthday to all of you last year because I do it almost everyone that comes up my feed, I say happy birthday. Why? Because I love you. Not really because I love you because I want more and more people on my birthday. Well, you have a thousand friends. You must get at least three a day that you say happy to say happy yes, birthday to right. you. Right. I'm putting my time in, Scott. Where were they? Oh, no, I'm I'm agreeing with you. Right. Actually. Where are no, they? But I stand by my needy comment from Oh, before. absolutely. <laughs> I'm so needy. It's sad. <laughs> Pathetic. Uh, yeah. But for the 163, thank you. <laughs> oh my god, a Facebook notification just came up. <laughs> Uh, oh my god, we both just got banned from Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook just closed both our accounts and our Whiskey Tangent account. <laughs> oh shit. Well, Mark Zuckerberg said, fuck you, bitches. Gosh, I hope the next one's not listening. Okay, so the next one is distilleries. Shame. <clears throat> which oh. kind of goes into the nature of whiskey, but specifically not the fact that they were having trouble catching up because we talked about that's the nature of whiskey, but uh. for creating a plethora of quarterly to yearly special releases and right. one-off whiskey unicorns and then allocating them and everything else only to certain areas, both of which creates artificial demand and uh, dries up prices in the secondary market. Right. I mean, they're aware of the secondary market. Sure. They're aware that this stuff is happening. Yeah. I mean, I don't really know how to feel about all of these things. I mean, we're casting blame here, but a lot of it is like, well, what are they supposed to do? Not release good stuff? Yeah, right. Like, we've spoken to some of the master distillers, and they're artists in a way, you know? They're, yeah. They come up with a flavor profile they want to try, and sometimes it's a blend, or sometimes twice barreled or finished in a certain way, but they only have so much whiskey, and so they put out maybe 10,000 bottles of something, which yeah. sounds like a lot, but not in a country of 329 million people, yeah. and so those 10,000 bottles, maybe 400 to 500 get in Jersey. And you certainly don't want to uh, stifle creativity right. because they, they have barrels that they're making just say Knob Creek. Well, you know, some of them want to say, well, let's put these barrels, age them for an extra 10 years and see what happens. Yeah. Right. Um, so the next one is the consumers of today. Shame. So we said yes. the consumers of the past who created the surge in demand before, but the consumers of today, specifically people with more money than sense, chasing right. every latest fad whiskey unicorns special releases and then hoarding what they find right you know i got an extra grind on that i do all right so about a week ago i'm on one of my uh, bourbon facebook groups <laughs> and there's a guy there named aaron aaron if you're listening you're an asshole um <laughs> and this is called being part of the problem and just being an obnoxious prick too by the way <laughs> Anyone else ever notice that the same people who bitch and complain about secondary prices and flippers are the same ones who say that the unicorns, specifically anything Buffalo Trace Distillery, are overrated. This is America. If you don't want to spend the money and someone else wants to, so be it. Leave the good stuff for us and drink your shitty bourbons. Mm. That's how I really feel. Well, well, Aaron, let me tell you something, all right? Mm. You have the right to your opinion, and if you think overpaying 20 times the MSRP makes you cool or is the only way to not drink shitty bourbon, you have a lot to learn about bourbon. Maybe it's your first day drinking bourbon. I'm not really sure. <laughs> I don't, maybe you're a trend puppy, you know, mm -hmm. but that's an obnoxious post. It's obnoxious. <laughs> all right. I've had George T. Stagg, and I don't think it's overrated. I think it's overpriced. Ah. Yes. Okay. So if There's it's a difference. if it's thirteen hundred dollars for what I consider, I would pay up to one fifty for George C. Stag. I think it's good. Mm. Now somebody else might think it's worth two hundred, and that's okay. We can have that discussion, Aaron. If you want to be in that discussion, but if you're telling me that I have to pay twelve fifty to drink George T. Stag to be cool as you, okay. Now Pappy fifteen. I know Fred Mittick said the version that was coming out in two thousand thirteen, whatever, was the best whiskey of the year. I had it. It was good. 
It was not the best whiskey I ever drank. Mm. I've never had the 20 or the 23, Mm -hmm. so I'm not talking about them, but I drank Pappy 15 within a month ago. And I drank it right after Jersey Stag, which might be the problem because the Jersey Stag was exceptional. Do you think, because I, of course, was there with you tasting this. Yeah. I mean, I think the answer is no. But do you think if we had sort of a reverse psychology with it, like we know that people love this so much. And when we tasted it, we were sort of biased against it. Like the expectation is so high and we already know oh. that it can't possibly live up to the hype. Were we... Uh, unfair to it you know i would say that's possible but i love the george t stag so much right and that's just as hyped right now Mm -hmm. so if if anything i was wrapped in anticipation of the pappy 15 to finally taste the pappy for the first time in my life if anything i was giddy and if i was disappointed by it then i think that's a realistic reaction now is it possible that i hyped it too much i don't think so i didn't hype it too much everybody else hyped it too much The secondary market hyped it too much. I didn't make it five thousand dollars for the twenty three. I didn't make it three thousand dollars a bottle for the fifteen or whatever. Right? We thought about yeah. three thousand, right? Yeah. But so, that's how insidious it is. Like we're affected by things that other people are doing. Right. Because I think when you look at what the problem is, you feel like I yeah. have to spend three hundred dollars to get a great whiskey. Yeah. That simply is not true, everybody. Now, you might have to pay $300 to get the whiskey that you want to drink, but then you have to ask yourself, why do you want to drink it? All right. Is it actually great tasting? Is it your favorite or is it simply something you feel that you have to have because it's so rare? It it comes down to being more of the hunt than actually the flavor in the glass. Mm. Maybe you honestly love Pappy 15 and you think it's the best whiskey you ever drank. How am I going to argue with you? It's your mouth. Right. You know? (laughs) Right. I can't climb into your mouth and taste what you're tasting. I'm just saying if you're someone who says I have to drink the antique collection to drink good whiskey, that's what we're saying. No, you don't. Right. So uh, I have a little story right here. So the next one is uh, flippers. Shame. They're the people who are taking advantage of the demand of the consumers, the, uh, right. what we just talked about, and uh, they're gouging the desperate seekers. So there was an article in Whiskey Advocate talking about the secondary market, and they interviewed this guy, Paul, and I just found this really irritating, just as you did that post on Facebook. Right. So it says in part... The term flipper sounds so bad, Paul groans, after I casually refer to him as such. This is the narrator of the right. article. As the midday sun streams in through his kitchen window, he leans back against a folding table that's overflowing with whiskey shipping supplies. He says, I sell high-end whiskey as a middleman, but I never feel bad about selling whiskey. It's like walking into a store, seeing 10 lotto tickets, one of which is a winner, and taking any of the nine losers. You don't leave winners on the shelves. I'm not ruining whiskey. I'm not the reason people can't get Van Winkle. I'm one fucking person. I don't have that much power. In Paul's home, just outside New York City, we connected with each other via Facebook bourbon group, Mm -hmm. and I've come, as agreed, with cash to buy a store pick for Rose's single barrel. Downstairs in his ramshackle basement, Paul's bunker of 300-plus bottles is divided between two shelving units, one containing every coveted bourbon and rye you've dreamt of owning, and the other containing rare scotch and Japanese whiskey, including Yamazaki Mizurina Oak from 1984. These are the same whiskeys that appear in glossy international auction catalogs. Paul yanks out his various bottles he calls Fire, including Willet 12-year-old, 2007 Hirsch, and 2006 Van Winkle. There used to be a lot more, but a lot of it was sold to buy this house. Wow. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's capitalism. Maybe that's fine. But I was fucking irritated because he doesn't drink it at all. He doesn't even like whiskey. Mm -hmm. He's just doing it to make a profit. Right. And why does that bother us more than baseball cards or rare coins? I I don't know. Why does it bother us? Because it does. Like, I'm already irritated reading that whole article. (laughs) But you know what? I think it falls into this. This is my closest analogy, Scott. Somehow they allow bots to now buy tickets for every concert. Yeah. As soon as concerts go on sale, yeah. these ticket brokers have these bots that just go out and just buy groups of four, groups of four, groups of four, groups of four, changing their IP addresses and whatever they need to do to, to do that. Mm-hmm. So within like, you know, 20 minutes, the concerts are sold out. And then as soon as you log on, a half hour after tickets go on sale, all you see is verified secondary tickets. Mm-hmm. 150 167 178 and it's kind of bullshit because no one protects the consumer from that and i think that's what we kind of feel like yeah and what pissed me off about this guy is he has so little self-awareness right right he says that he doesn't have that much power he's one fucking person but he's the whole problem right he is literally the problem because there's not just one of him right there's thousands of him right and collectively you do have that much power right so if there's a thousand guys like him and he has 300 rare bottles 
that's 300,000 rare bottles. Right. So that's, that's why we don't have any. That's why we don't have it all. Right. I think there's probably 5,000 guys uh, who probably maybe not are as big as him, but right. have at least 50 to 100 bottles in their garage. Right. I guess I felt like if your town was starving for some reason and you had way more food than you needed and then you just sat back and watched your neighbor starve. Or you charge them Or you charge them $1,000 for like a bologna sandwich. Right. I know this is not the same because no one's starving. I mean, whiskey is a luxury. Let's be honest. Yeah. We, yeah. I need it. I mean, it's not a luxury for me. I need it. But do I need <laughs> McHenry McKenna? No. But I feel like they're the same people. I feel like it's that same guy that would pour the food and watch his neighbors die yeah. or charge them $1,000 for a bologna sandwich. I feel it's the same type of person. And the whole thing, is too, it's legal in that article he's like right. you're not from the irs are you so you're flouting the law at right. your profit and saying that you're not part of the problem it just fucking pissed me off yeah so i'm with you on that so the next one distributors and retailers shame so distributors for in the states that they're allowed to do this because if right. they were allowed to do it in every state they would demanding that people buy the crap like fireball or like crap vodka in order to get right. allocations. And then the retailers being the last line of price raising can abuse that position. And we've talked a lot about this before, but you know, they should bear part of the blame. Right. We talked about how Barton's has well level vodka and gin. Right. I mean, they have really good whiskey. Their vodka and gin is basically shit. Now they don't have the antique collection, but just pretend that Barton's had a really special bottle hmm. and you had to buy six cases of shitty gin. It's actually bullying is what it is. Yeah. It's, just, it's just bullying. It kind of is. It's like the mafia. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> well, what did we hear about Jersey, right? Yeah. Matt didn't work in Jersey because there's something shady about our distributors. Yeah. I mean, no offense out there. New Jersey distributors, I'm not dissing you. I'm just saying that everything I hear from other people from other states is that you do it different than they do. Right. It's a lot of franchises and family business, you know what I mean, by family. Yeah. La familia. <laughs> La cosa nostra. <laughs> okay, so the next one, the media. Shame. Specifically, like social media influencers on Instagram, but also just whiskey reviewers, authors, right. um, magazines like Whiskey Advocate, right. uh, podcasters like us, uh, but you know, ones with a lot more reach than we have. But yeah. are we part of the problem? I don't know. See, I put my opinion out there, and we've talked about our favorite whiskeys on here. And so, have we started a, a local run on Henry McKenna or, you know, Dirty Bid's Last Feather Rhyme? Right. I think you, you said know? last time, it's like, we like the Russell so much. It's like, are we going to cause a Scarcity. Right, we're gonna by telling people to do Russell instead of Blands that we cause a new problem. But. Right. It's difficult to say. Uh, right. I know I see a lot of complaints about Instagram influencers and how they have a bottle right next right. to a glass, and the glass is full of whiskey, but the bottle is unopened. Right. The fuck is that? Yeah. It's all fake. Right. So what does that mean? Is that an offer to sell it? I'm, it's, I, I'm, it's just you know uh, here's what I'm drinking, but right. you're not actually drinking it. You have brown water in a glass, right. and you have a full <laughs> uh, unopened bottle of whiskey right. next to you. <laughs> what do we do for photos, Scott? Beyond, let's be transparent for once. So if we drink all of a whiskey before we take photos of the episode, we usually put Johnny Walker Red in it. <laughs> <laughs> We've, I've done that. We yeah. have. We need whiskey in a glass. The person maybe who brought the bottle for the episode left, took it with him. Like, oh, shit, we didn't get any photos. Right. And so we had to go get the Johnny Walker Red out. And then we pour it back in because none of us drink that swill. <laughs> yeah, no, it's gross. It is. It's very gross. <laughs> but at least the bottle was open. Oh, right. Yeah. We did drink it. I mean, yeah. that, the, the that was just to take a picture. <laughs> right. It was of just it. a picture. Yeah. You know, like, we're not lying. No, we're not yeah. lying. We're just, the photo's lying. We, we were just lazy and didn't That's take a picture. Right. <laughs> That's right. We're just too drunk to take a picture while they were here. <laughs> um, so the last one in the blame. So then we'll get more positive after sure, this. Sure, sure. Right. We're bringing the downer to the end. <laughs> right. So um, you kind of touched on it a little bit right before we started this, but competitions. Shame. So like Fred Minnick talked about, he was in that competition that made Pappy uh, raise its profile. The Henry McKenna is a great example yep. of it. It won the uh, fucking San Francisco World Spirits competition. I mean, and it raised that thing's profile. Yeah, I to was the getting point. that for $32 any day I wanted it. Um, and then one day it was gone. Yeah. Just gone. It was like right after we did that episode where we had pretty much tasted it for the yep. first time. Or maybe we'd had it once or twice and we really liked it. And that's why we featured it. Yep. But then it was so hard to get after that. Yeah. I mean, these competitions, there's a lot of them now. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this might be a ripe subject maybe for next year's Whiskey Maybe remember. so. Take yeah. a look at what competitions are working. and Because uh, I know they're kind of seedy. Right. Because yeah. uh, they, they charge a lot for you right. to enter them. Maybe we'll have Fred Medic on that one. He can talk about oh, his yeah. experience. Good old Fred. Yeah, Fred. 
<laughs> All right. So now we're going to go into the how we can fix it. So yep. the, the first one is just start producing more. Distillers simply need to produce more of the good stuff. I know that's a big right. ask. And, you know, I don't understand everything that goes into making a barrel of whiskey. But get creative with quicker aging techniques. We've seen uh, Makers 46. Broken well, the, barrel. The broken barrel. Uh, the Corsair use smaller barrels to yep. age their whiskeys faster. Like they can invest more in distilling equipment, barrels, staff, rickhouses, whatever it takes. Like Buffalo Trace has really ramped up, but it takes so long for the whiskey to get <laughs> out there that like they're not going to catch but wait, up. Wait, what did we hear? Soon. Blanton's has they made the one tin rickhouse for Blanton's. Like, can we make three tin rickhouses <laughs> for Blanton? Have more Blanton's, son, please. Right. What the hell is that? One rickhouse. But right, but that's still at least probably four, five years down the road. Yeah, yeah, right. for Buffalo Trace to catch up to what they were doing. Sure. So the next one is selling less. Liquor stores need to start selling one per customer for highly sought after brands. Right. So, Some do, but there's no real rule on it. No. This does three things. So it prevents hoarding. Yep. It allows everyone a fair chance to buy something. Yep. And if someone only has one they may be less likely to flip it on the secondary market if they're at all inclined to drink it. So there's no more like buying one and flipping one. Right, right. That works for me. If the day I bought the two Eagle Rares, I could only have had one, I wouldn't have thrown a tantrum. I'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, the next one after this is improving liquor store websites. Yes. So we actually talked a little bit about this with Matt. He had some interesting things to say. But mom and pop stores should try to improve their websites. I know yeah. that's probably hard to get tech help for that, but there are national companies that do websites and stuff. Of course there are. And you can attach it to the database of your inventory system. But really what was interesting, what Matt had to say in our conversation was sort of like someone really needs to create the Amazon of whiskey. You know, with the digital transformation that we're seeing, you know, there's more exposure to the brands, to the consumers now. They can find where it is. You know, they can search the internet. They can search the different prices. You don't have to drive 10 miles down the way to look at one liquor store versus 10 miles down the other location. So that's going to help out. I remember going with my dad to the hardware store. He needs a new drill. We'd go there and, you know, there'd be three different brands. And nowadays you can go on Amazon, right? And you can see every single brand available out there with the reviews and you can order it and it'll be at your doorstep. And listen, for the liquor stores out there, if they're not investing in digital and, and creating their own websites, and the big thing now is they, we call it extended shelf, where basically they are working with their distributors that are selling to them and they have all the different products and they're posting on their website for the consumer to just place the order, may not be in inventory in their back room, but they place that order. They then place the order, goes to the distributor, the distributor brings it the next day, and there's the product for the consumer. And so what I take from that is not just an Amazon from the consumer point of view, like the way we can go on with Drizzly and Flaviar and order bottles. If you have XYZ liquors, you're not surviving on just the allocation to New Jersey mm -hmm. or just your store in Ohio, wherever you are. You can go into a, a national database and order right. from whatever the supply of Pappy, whatever the supply of Weller, so that Texas may end up getting a little bit less, but Jersey and Pennsylvania might get a little bit more and more people are happy. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. I think some type of a modern electric system for the retailers to be able to supply themselves, not just whatever is broken off, whatever crumbs they're given, yeah. but able to access the database. I think it would keep the prices pretty much uniformed. Yeah. And it would alleviate the regional scarcity. So take the Weller example in Texas, because if Texas has so much Weller sitting on its shelf, right. it's not moving the product. Right. And so that incentivizes people in the secondary market to grab six and then flip them to people in the Northeast where right. we can't get them. Right. So this would prevent all of that from happening. And the places in Texas sell their whiskey. Win-win. Right. Absolutely. I solved it right there. There we go. <laughs> why even go on? Yeah, why even go on? That's it. We'll end the podcast. See, see you later. All right. Hope you enjoyed part three. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't drank yet. So no. Oh, Jesus. So I thought this was intensely interesting. I, I kind of went down a little bit of a rabbit hole about this, but using technology on the bottle, like QR codes and holographic labels that go over the thing. So the QR codes could have information in them that ties you directly to the manufacturer's website. And it proves that that bottle is legitimate right, because it has a code right, and it right, has because fakes is a problem too. Fakes is a problem. The second thing about the holographic labels is the labels are really hard to counterfeit. Right. And then they break 
once you twist it off. Right. So the QR code with the holographic label together proves that the bottle is legit, and then it also proves that the liquid inside has not been tampered with. Right, because let's say we get a barrel of Redemption wheat, and then... Put in the jo- Johnny right, Walker. Right, and then... No, and then wrap it up in oh, happy labels that I we see. print off i mean people have high-tech laser printers that can counterfeit anything you know yeah so we get it legally bottled they ship it to us we rip off all those labels we mm-hmm. put on the new labels which is completely illegal but before anyone realizes that they taste it, it's kind of weedy it's like mm, that's not what i expected and they've already paid you three thousand dollars right and i'm right and i'm gone <laughs> like, i'm like a fart in the wind <laughs> This one's controversial. People seem to hate it. (laughs) But I thought I'd list it here anyway. Opening bottles. Forcing people to open the bottles before they leave the liquor store. (laughs) Oh, like we're getting a beer at the stadium? (laughs) I can tell you right now, that would annoy me. So I can't imagine. (laughs) Right. I know. So because nobody can flip an already open bottle. It's just a way. I'm not saying that we should do this, but um, it's a way that's been suggested. And uh, like I said, it's very controversial. Ed doesn't want to do it. No, but it would solve the problem of flipping. But so what if you buy six bottles? You got to open all six of them? Oh my God, can you imagine doing that? Yeah. I, listen, don't send emails over that. I don't agree with that. So. <laughs> We're not advocating that at all. We're just saying it's what people say. It's a thing, right? Um, the next one is just simply for consumers to buy less. Try to train yourself out of the need to always have every new expression of every brand because you know what? You can't keep up. You can't. It's impossible to keep up with every expression of every brand that's coming out. There's so much whiskey. We we joked early on on the podcast. It's like, if we do at least two whiskeys per episode, are we going to run out of whiskey? But we're so naive and stupid back then. We were. We're never going to run out of whiskey. We could do this forever. (laughs) So buy less. That's it. (laughs) Buy less. Buy less. You don't have to have everything. Right. Right. You don't have to. You want to, but you don't have to. Right. There's kind of a goal in the lounge to be someone who's drank 100 different whiskeys in the lounge, right? Right, right. So with that mentality, if you apply that to your liquor store purchases, buy 10 bottles yeah. before you buy the same bottle again, you right, know? Right, right. Play a game like that with yourself just to try different stuff. Yeah. And that also kind of leads into the next one, which was hoard less. <laughs> You're a hoarder. You're a hoarder. Your mother. Your, mm, your Trebek. <laughs> So what Ed does, and Ed said many times on this podcast what he does, he buys an expression, but he doesn't open a new one unless he has one that's unopened. So basically he's saying he needs at least two. What I'm saying is do what Ed does, but make it just two. You always have one opened and one unopened. This means that you never run out and people can buy it as well. Right. What I mean by that is if you're my favorite. I like to have two heavy mechanics, one I'm drinking and one I'm not. Right. And so when I drink the first one, I try to hold the second one without opening it so I can find another one. Scott thinks that's stupid. No, He's no. Like, I'm okay with it. Well, it, he wasn't at first. <laughs> I, I just thought it was kind of funny. But honestly, now that I've done all this, I think that's a way for people to hoard less. Like I said, you still have one. Correct. All right. So the next one is, you know what? Just share more. Get your friends together, yeah. each with a different bottle, and host a tasting party. Love it. Um, that way, you get to taste a half a dozen or more, depending on how many friends you have or invite, at a time, all for the price of a single bottle. Right. I mean, I love that idea. I've been to several tastings yeah. like that. That's how I discovered Angel's Envy Rye. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, also, join a whiskey lounge. Yeah. In our local lounge, all the locker owners love to share whiskey with yep. each other. Mir, they're the most generous guys. As soon as you walk in, they tell you what they got in their locker. Oh, I got, you know, Middleton Rare. You know, I got the Boss Hogs in there. You need to try the new one. And we do the same from our locker. We don't normally have Middleton Rare, though. but <laughs> Or the Boss Hog. I mean, doing the podcast, in two years, we had 110 empty bottles mm. at, at the podcast studio. Yeah, m- most of them are in my storage, storage unit. Right. So that's an amazing amount of drinking for two years. But It is. Why, why aren't we dead? Um, why, uh, I don't know. Modern medicine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I just built a new liver and a 3D printer. So go ahead. We'll, and the last one. So the last one is, and it's the one we've been hounding in yep. your brain yep. for the past two episodes, and we're going to pound it more. Buy something else. Instead of being disappointed with what you can't get, get excited about what you can. Right. And so in the spirit of that, Scott and I have put together a list of alternatives. So what I did was Whiskey Advocate had a list of the most flipped whiskeys. Right. There were actually like 12 or 13 on them, but I whittled it down to 10. Right. And um, here we go. Number 10, Michter's 10-Year Single Barrel Bourbon. 
So I'm going to give you the MSRP. And then I went on Wine Searcher to get the average price and also the most outrageous high price that they have. All right, let's do this. And then we'll give you some alternatives. Maybe one, maybe two. So the Whiskey Advocate MSRP is $130 okay. for the Michter's 10-year. The Wine Searcher price is 354 on average, but a high of 999 Wow. Big head. Alternatives. So some of these we picked the same because we came up with the same right. one, and some of them we came up with different ones. For this one, incidentally, what we are already drinking, the Knob Creek Single Barrel. So I was in the uh, Benash the other day, and uh, they had one of their store picks, and it's a Knob Creek Single Barrel. And it, it's, you know, probably somewhere 9, 10 years old, 120 proof, and it was $54. Yeah. And now you can't really buy knob creek single barrel very easily but you need to look around at what your local places are doing i mean we have grocery stores up here doing barrel picks yeah. we have bars doing barrel picks and we have liquor stores doing barrel picks and the knob creek is sitting there a known brand and, and we're drinking it right now for 54 dollars, and it's 120 proof and it's 10 years old and it's delicious it's astoundingly good number nine old Fitzgerald 15 year uh the whiskey advocate msrp is 150 dollars. the wine searcher average price is 680 the high is six ninety five, so it was uh, pretty close. Wow! Uh, the alternative that I came up with was, and you know, this is getting scarcer yeah. to find. Of course, is the Larceny Barrel Proof. Oh yeah! If you can get it, it's like you know, I have to pay a hundred dollars, one hundred and twenty, but it's not six hundred and eighty. Right. And uh, Ed's was the Rebel Tenure Single Barrel. Right, Rebel Tenure Single Barrel. It's the same distillate. Okay, it's sourced from Heaven Hill to Lux Row, and it can be pricey because people are starting to realize what I just told you. Mm. But you might have to pay maybe a hundred, right? If someone knows what they have, and it's still not six hundred dollars, right? I mean, these are alternatives; they're not going to be perfect matches. And Lux Row puts out interesting products, right? The old Ezra, mm, the old Blood Oath. You know, they're, they're good at sourcing. Yeah, and just for the record, they don't just put shit out to put shit out. They're kind of egomaniacs over at Lux Row, so like <laughs> they really put stuff out that they think is special. Yeah, they're all about like swag, you yeah, know, the yeah. swagger. They named them Lux Row. Yeah, <laughs> right, right there you go. <laughs> Number eight, Baker's thirteen year single barrel bourbon the msrp is 99 the average price is 499 with a high of 506 and the one we both came up with for this one is the baker's seven year single barrel just get the seven year it's everywhere and it's delicious why chase the 13 year unicorn for 500 dollars? what's the baker's seven year 60 oh 65 dollars. yeah that's like the nine times less delicious we go back and listen to her yeah our bakers I mean, versus honestly. bakers number seven hibiki 17 year japanese its msrp is 150 dollars. average price online is a thousand five dollars the Jesus. high is two thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and the alternative whiskey the hibiki harmony yeah with just, uh, no age statement yeah it's about a hundred dollars and it's delicious and once again is it as good i don't know but it's definitely worth buying for $100 over $500. It's the same stuff, only a little bit younger because they don't have all right. 17s anymore. They right. have to blend it stuff together. Go listen right. to the Japanese Christmas one. Love that episode, by the way. We're geniuses. I love Christmas. Christmas time is calling Santa, Santa, Santa. Santa. Number six, W. Weller 12-year weeded bourbon. The MSRP is $37. Wine searcher price is three hundred and seventy four on average, one thousand six hundred and ninety nine dollars. For a thirty eight dollar bottle. And our alternative for this one, the seventeen ninety two sweet wheat. That's right. Fifty three bucks. I love you, sweet wheat. You gotta realize. <laughs> Are you singing uh, Sabbath? Uh, Sabbath, yeah. Sweet leaf. Sweet leaf, yeah. <laughs> you should just cut that out. <laughs> Maybe I'll drop in the actual yeah. sweet leaf song. Oh yeah, do that. Number five, Elmer T. Lee, 100 year tribute bourbon. It's not actually 100 years. They're liars. MSRP 100. The average price is 1,299 <laughs> on average. The high was 1,397. Let's go to Aaron real quick. Hey, man, if you don't want to drink good whiskey and spend $1,000 for Elmer T. Lee, well, then take off a. Oh, he's Canadian now. Yeah. No, it's not Canadian. He does a Rush fan. <laughs> oh, I see. So we have two alternatives for this. The one I picked was Ancient Age 10 Star. Um, it's this, Well, so here's my rationale. So, yeah, I know it's a little ridiculous, but it's the same company. Right. It's the same mash bill. 
and it's only aged three to five years less, but it costs fifteen dollars. And that you can't find. <laughs> and you can find that anywhere. And Ed's was the John J. Bowman bourbon single barrel. Right. Now, this one is the same distillate, Buffalo Trace number two. Mm. However, it's distilled twice more once it gets to Virginia. And a couple people online said it's even smoother and better tasting than the Elmer T. Lee. Wow. Well, maybe we have to put that one to the test. I mean, we didn't like the Isaac Bowman, but John Jay is different than Isaac. Number four, Willett Six-Year Family Estate Bourbon. The MSRP is 100 the average price was $1,360. Jesus. <laughs> the high price was $4,999. Uh, we came up with two alternatives for this one as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I came up with the Wild Turkey Rare Breed Barrel okay. Proof. It was in one of the lists that I found that gave us the Bell Mead alternative for the right. Kentucky and Owl. What is it? It's a blend of what? Because it's really interesting. It said it was a blend of 6, 8, and 12-year bourbon expressions. Right. Expressions, yep. yeah. And so, I mean, $50. We've, <laughs> we've had the Rare Breed. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, we featured it on a Thanksgiving episode a couple yeah, years ago. Our first one. Yep. Yeah. Ed's was the pure Kentucky XO. Right, because it's from Willet. It's delicious. It's 107 proof. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit less. Because the Willet six year is uh, like cast strength. So it could right. be like 120. Or but something. if you put that Willet on a globe, it'll eventually get down to where the XO is, I'm sure, at 107. But I love the XO. I think the XO 107 for $44 or so is one of the best bargains in the bourbon world. Mm. And, and didn't the selection committee pick that for the whiskey? Madness? Yeah, foreshadowing. <laughs> uh, the Kentucky XO will be mm. in this year's Whiskey Madness. Will it? <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> Number three, Old Forester Birthday. Now, a lot of people hate on this bourbon, and yeah. I don't really know why, because I've never had it. But yeah. they say, eh, it's not really good, but that could just be trolls like we talked about before. The MSRP is 100 The average price is $1,491. The high that I saw was $6,499. And our alternative is simply, it's Label Mate, the Old Forester 1920 Prohibition. Just drink that. It's delicious. It's high proof. It's a wonderful dram. High flavor. Yeah. 50-ish. Let's call it 60. Yeah. It's definitely not. 1,400. Yeah, it's definitely not 1,000. You could have 10 bottles of the Old Forester 1920 for one of the birthday. Seriously. And this is what we're talking about. But yeah. if you're a rich son of a bitch who has money to burn, then, mm. then go buy the birthday for 1,000. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm oh. just saying for most of us, right. that's half your rent. Right. It's the price of a used Honda, as Fred Minnick said. Number two, William LaRue Weller. This is part of their antique collection. Right, not not the WL Weller. Right, right. 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 The MSRP is 99. The average is $2,734. The high is (laughs) $12,995. And the alternative, frankly, we couldn't find one. What online, because we've never had this expression, and we were going to put up like other Weller expressions, but you can't get them either. Right. They're fucking expensive too. And I went down through this deep Reddit thread asking this exact question, and the consensus among 30 other people was, it's so unique, there is no alternative. Similar to the Angel Envy Rye. Right. Uh, We've tried to find other rum-finished whiskeys that taste like it with that deep molasses flavor Mm -hmm. and finish at the end, but we haven't really been successful. No, the, the Nobody is producing anything like it. 18 months. That's where people go wrong. They're trying to manufacture a rum-finished bourbon and thinking it's going to be this good thing, but they're not aging it long enough. So we don't have an alternative. Sorry. Yeah. So in that case, you might have to put it on layaway. Shell out $13,000 worth. Right. Put it on layaway. Was this Kmart (laughs) in the 70s? Yeah. (laughs) Number one, Pappy Van Winkle, 23 year. (laughs) The MSRP is 250. The... Average price, ready? Yeah. $7,033. The high price that I saw, $28,999. And the alternative, we're actually going to drink. Yeah, so there's a far-reaching effect of this. Because of the scarcity of the Pappy line, people then went to the George T. Stagg and Stagg Jr., Yep. And then they became rare. And then yep. they went to the Weller. You know, I think cascading effect. A, a, yeah. I mean, Antique 107 is actually very, very similar, I've heard from people, to Pappy 15. Yeah. So that became rare. And so then, it's an old Fitzgerald. Is that a wheat one, too? I, yeah. So old Fitzgerald's weeded from Heaven Hill, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's now rare. Yeah. Because that was considered an alternative to Pappy. So anything that's been named an alternative to Pappy quickly 
really becomes just as rare. Right. So now we're sitting here. Do we have to drink something? So what we decided to do was to try the Maker's 46 cast strength, yeah. which is really weak. You know, I mean, it's 110. Yeah. It, it doesn't seem like yeah. cast strength. I me. mean, that's what it says, right? Yeah, it does. So this might be a shit show because we didn't really care for Maker's 46. We right. had that origin story with it where we decided it was probably a drain pour. Right. But then we tasted it later and then we had a better opinion of it. Right. And, and this is cast strength. So, right. And it's a weeded mash bill. And, right. Yeah, and then to go along with it, another weeded whiskey, a weeded bourbon rather, is the Wyoming White Label whiskey. Yeah, I thought we'd give you uh, two alternatives. Right. This one's only eighty-eight proof for because we like to drink two. <laughs> <laughs> right, if you're right. And so we have these in our neat glasses waiting to be tasted. Yeah. Before we go into what we're going to drink today, Scott, uh, do you know why Pappy's the uh, Pappy? I do, in fact. Uh, we've never actually covered Pappy Van Winkle on the podcast because, of course, we can't fucking <laughs> we get it. Real. We didn't have an extra seven grand laying around. Do you have 30 grand to pay for a 23 year old? Oh, that came out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. Well, she's 23. It would be illegal. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's legal. It would be solicitation, so it's still, mm. we're still going to jail. That's true. Okay. All right. So in 1893, Julian Pappy Van Winkle began working at the W.O. Weller and Sons, first as a traveling whiskey salesman, and eventually buying the company, buying another distillery, and eventually becoming the president of Stitzel Weller. He helped shape the industry during and after Prohibition through his endeavors in the warehouse, the boardroom, and on the road. He built a reputation in the bourbon industry. Fine bourbon was his mission, and he accepted nothing less. In 1965, Julian Sr. died and his son, Julian Jr., took over the distillery until the family sold it in 1972. Not one to be defeated, he got himself an office and a secretary and formed a company called J.P. Van Winkle and Son and started marketing bourbon in many types of commemorative decanters. But he never stopped bottling on the side, creating the old Rip Van Winkle label as a side venture in case his son, Julian III, wanted to come into the business. Presciently, in 1981, just 32 years old, Julian III took over the business after his father passed away. The bourbon business was in a lull, but using the same innate passion that powered his grandfather to start a business from the ground up, Julian purchased Old Hoffman Distillery in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky for barrel storage and bottling purposes. He couldn't afford much advertising, but the quality of Old Rip Van Winkle sold itself. Julian III and his impeccable palate also created quite a stir, but his big break was in the early 90s when the Chicago Beverage Tasting Institute gave a bottle of 20-year-old Pappy Van Winkle a tasting score of 99 out of 100. <laughs> Even back then, the award show. Mm -hmm. Van Winkle was finally on the radar of a new group of whiskey drinkers, and from then on, the Van Winkle family's bourbon racked up award after award in multiple tasting competitions. In the early 2000s, when first approached by Buffalo Trace, Julian III was honored, but not immediately interested. He had ample bourbon aging, but the concern was for future reserves, since by this time, bourbon was increasing in popularity. Buffalo Trace had bought the W.L. Weller label just a few years earlier and had been making bourbon with nearly the same recipe as Pappy's, so the transition was actually an easy one. As of May 2002, Buffalo Trace has produced Van Winkle bourbons using Pappy's exact recipe, allowing old Rip Van Winkle to maintain strict quality standards while producing more barrels for future enjoyment. Yeah, right. Maybe. <laughs> this was from their website. <laughs> rumor has it. Yeah, rumor has it that they have some for us to drink. So, what are we going to taste first, the 46 or the Wyoming? Oh, uh, we should taste the Wyoming first because we don't want to overpower it with the high proof of uh, the other one. All right, good idea. So we're going to take the uh, Wyoming whiskey. First introduced to me by my cousin Nancy's husband, Greg. He brought it back with him from Wyoming. Oh, did he? So yeah, so I have a uh, quick description about the Wyoming weeded bourbons. This is from their website. Brad and Kate Mead founded Wyoming Whiskey in 2009 as the state's first legal distillery. Their mash bill of corn, winter wheat, and barley are locally sourced for specific starch and sugar yields. The water comes from nearby Madison Formation, an aquifer whose underlying limestone is millions of years old. But to really attain their unique profile, they use a combination of two yeasts, a well-known high-yield yeast and a second proprietary yeast that yields a little bit less, but produces a slightly fruitier alcohol. As they say on their website, we make bourbon in small batches at our distillery in Wyoming's Bighorn Basin. From day one, every drop of Wyoming whiskey was made here and aged in one of our six rick houses. That's not true of every whiskey you run into. We don't pass judgment, but it means a lot to us, and we hope it means something to you. So the stats are here. Mash bill of 68% corn, 20% wheat, 12% malted barley. Its proof is 88. Uh, there's no age statement, but it's about five years. And the distiller is Wyoming Whiskey of Kirby, Wyoming. So I just took the cap off with a neat glass. Oh, that's interesting smell. It's very mild. There's a light fruit there, like a pear. Mm-hmm. 
Are you getting that? Yeah, there's pear. I'm not getting any like vanilla or caramel or anything like that. It's weird. It's like very f- fruit floral, mm-hmm. very sweet to the nose, but not sugary sweet, like a fruit sweetness. Yes, it's like fructose. Like a fruit juice almost. Yeah, it's nice. It's a little, uh, What what is that kind of, it's not sharp. It's like, a, it's earthy, like peanut shells. There's mm, something yeah. earthy there. Okay, let's taste it. Okay. Oh, <laughs> it's a little harsh for being 88 proof. It just tastes a little bit immature to me. It's not tremendously weeded then at 20. No, it's not. But it does have a little bit of fire for 88. It, it does. It has a little bit of spiciness on it. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's what you mean. Or do you mean alcohol fire? Uh, I don't know what I mean. It's actually getting better the more I sip it. I agree. It, the first sip was a little strange. Absolutely pear, maybe even a little raisin. The fruits have settled into the palate as well that I smelled on the nose. It's got um, caramel, cinnamon. Yeah. But there's something burnt almost. Yeah. It's really mild. Could be like a little faint creme brulee. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like it. This is very spicy for having no rye. It's very spicy. But it is, like, overall, it's very mild, and that's got to be its 88 proof. Yeah, right? the finish is very mild. Yeah. It it's actually kind of like a little bit fiery when you first sip it alcohol-wise, too. Yeah. And then it finishes smooth and very mild. Let's see. So the tasting notes, I got this. This is from their website. Uh, floral with a hint of vanilla bean and caramel pudding. Interesting. Uh, the palette is also floral with baking spices, brown butter, brown butter. Mm, That's could be the kind burnt. of that toasty burnt thing. Yeah, it could be what you got. Mm-hmm. Uh, vanilla cream, uh, caramel, and a hint of cinnamon. All right. Uh, the finish is medium finish of toffee, vanilla, and spice. Pretty good. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, I can't say that this in particular would be a good replacement for no. Pappy Van Winkle, no. but if you're looking for that weeded mash bill and don't want to spend $13,000, right. <laughs> maybe get the Wyoming whiskey. Give it a try. Yeah. White, white label. It's called the uh, Small Batch Bourbon Whiskey. It doesn't really say that it's weeded on the label. No, it doesn't. So it's a white label. They have a couple different expressions. All right, so let's take a look at the Maker's Mark 46. Once again, an outstanding company. You know, been around forever. Right, and we talked about uh, Maker's Mark twice on the podcast so far, so um, we don't need to rehash that all again, but I have a few short paragraphs, uh, description about Maker's 46 in particular. Released in 2010, Maker's Mark 46 was the brainchild of Bill Samuels Jr., son of the Maker's Mark founders, Bill and Margie, and it was the first new major expression to be created at the Maker's Mark distillery since 1953 when the original bourbon went into production. Expertly finished for bolder character, the whiskey starts off as standard Maker's Mark, a weeded bourbon made in batches of less than a thousand gallons. Heavily seared French oak staves are placed in just emptied standard Maker's Mark barrels, which are then refilled and returned to the warehouses to finish aging for an additional two to three three months. These staves are the essential component to the amped up notes of vanilla and caramel of Maker's Mark 46, but without the bitterness that often comes with additional aging. The wood finishing experiments were in partnership with the independent stave company, the distillery's longtime cooperage, and after finally finding the flavor they were after, Bill Jr. learned that the code name for the perfectly toasted French oak stave they used was stave profile number 46. So that's where they get the name. The cast strength version that we have here today was originally released as a distillery only product in 2015, reintroduced in 2020 to celebrate the brand's 10th anniversary, and shortly thereafter made available as a wider limited release. So the stats are the mash bill is 70% corn, 16% wheat, 14% malted barley, which is pretty close to the other one, which was uh, to the Wyoming, which was 68, 20, and 12. Even less wheat, though. Yeah, Yeah, which is very strange. The proof is 110.3, uh, no age statement, but reportedly at least six years. Uh, the distillery is Maker's Mark Distillery of Loretto, Kentucky, and the owner, of course, is Beam Suntory. So much oak on the nose. You're going to be surprised. It's so oaky. Mm, yeah. It's like I'm smelling a two by four. <sighs> right. It smells like wood. It doesn't smell like charred wood. No. It smells just like wood. Hmm. I mean, I'm getting a little uh, like cinnamon and spice. Darker fruit notes yeah. in this one, not a pear. No. Definitely got your cinnamon on that last one. Yeah. Ooh, I really like it. I would like the nose better to this one. Maybe because it's cast strength. Maybe there's yeah. extra flavors going bump. on there. Let's, let's take a taste. A little bump. Hmm. Oh, shit. I just look at the nose tasting notes and <laughs> damn it. I totally missed it, but I can absolutely detect it. Light sense of graham cracker. Oh. Yeah. Toasted oak and marshmallow with hints of toffee and light caramel along with a bold dash of cinnamon. The graham cracker is what really I should have mentioned because that, that's exactly what it smells like. Tasting? Yeah. Wow, it's different. Oh. So much oak. 
Mm-hmm. So much wood. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, on the finish too. Wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you licked a board. But it's, somehow it's enjoyable. Why is it yeah, enjoyable? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Why is it good? It is good. I'm yeah. surprised <laughs> I like this. Ooh, like a little bit of licorice maybe? Yes, 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 licorice. Man, that flavor is so, it flows right through it. They're sweet there too, though. I almost feel like I had some buka in the glass before, <laughs> or anisette in yeah, the glass before yeah. I poured the whiskey in. I've never had a finish like this. Yeah. This is really unique. Wow. So peppery on the tongue, too. As soon as you pour it on your tongue, it just starts to fire off. Yeah, 110. So this maybe would be a good alternative because the pappies are like 107 and right, this is so like 110. If you're looking at the 15 year pappy, yeah. I don't I've never had the 23 and I'm not going to say that the Maker's Mark cast is going to be that, but the Maker's 46, if you're looking for an alternative for Pappy 15 and you know the palate of it, you've drank it a lot, give it a try and then, you know, email us and let us know what you think. This is really good cuz I remember the Pappy 15 that we had and we just didn't find it all that distinctive. It was a fine bourbon. There was nothing wrong with it. But we talked off air about looking back on whiskeys that you've had before, but only had once. Right. And you remember more your experience of tasting it than what you actually tasted. Right. You remember what you felt like in the moment when you drank it. Right. Which is why I couldn't break down what George T. Stagg tasted like flavor note for flavor note. But I remember when I drank it, how... I reacted to it. Yeah. And I remember reacting like it was a very unique whiskey, one that was worth the hype. Yeah. Whereas our experience with the Van Winkle was uh, not that. <laughs> it was, it was, eh, this is good, but um, I, I don't see what the hype is about. And I mean, it could have been a $100 whiskey, yeah. which is what it is, for really. Not the 23, but the 15. Right. And I'd like to try it again. And if you love Pappy 15 and you think I'm missing something, once again, whiskeytangent at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. Yeah, so let's go through the tasting notes. This is from Breaking Bourbon. For the Maker's Mart 46. Yes. For the palate, sweet cinnamon burst forward with tenacity. Following up behind are vanilla and light oak with a swirl of gentle wheat grain and honey. Light oak? That's, that's the lie of the night. <laughs> Not light oak. Heavy oak. Heavy oak. On the finish, a flash of heat is followed by cinnamon, honey, and dry oak. This flavor combination swirls together for a while before eventually transforming to a pleasant light oak resting on a bed of heat. Well, I'm glad he said oak three fucking times because that's what we're saying. It's oak, 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 oak. Right. Oak, oak, oak. (laughs) Oak, oak, oak. Just for the record, I did not sing along, everybody. That was not me. (laughs) <laughs> so what I was wondering, and I, I mentioned this to Scott, that just because we can't leave well enough alone, mm. what if we did like two or three parts of the 46 to keep the proof up and then th- throw a splash of the Wyoming weed in there to make our own little version of a, of a pappy? Right. So uh, this is very popular mm. on the interwebs. People trying to make a poor man's pappy, right? Uh, there's a lot of articles about it, and people use a lot of different right. like, weeded bourbons that you right. can get. And my, right. And my idea for this came from somebody who took Maker's Mark Cast Strength and they took the Larceny and they combined it to, and they said that was Pappy. Right, and the reason why we didn't do that here was because we had already featured them before. Right, we featured both of them already so we wanted to feature two that we didn't right. that were similar. So we had the Maker's Mark 46 and the Wyoming. Right, so we're going to mix them, what, like three to one? Yeah, three, three to one. one. Okay. So let's pause a second so we get some All mixing right. glasses and do it right. All right. All right, so uh, I fucked everything up, and um, (laughs) I poured it three times, uh, once for Ed, which I did correctly, once for me, and then I mixed up the glasses, so I had to pour it again. All right, so what we did was we took three quarters of an ounce of the Maker's 46 and and a quarter ounce of the Wyoming weeded uh, whiskey. And so we put it in our neat glass. Yeah. Once again, we have have a lid on it because the lid helps trap the vapors mm. we're giving it a nice little swirl wow hmm. i mean it smells what i smelled before but it's kind of a little bit of a combination yeah hmm. i mean it's a little sweeter than the Ooh. maker's mark by itself because it was so I, oaky i kind of like it <laughs> i like it too i think we might be on to something with it i was wondering why they were blending larceny with the maker's cast because the maker's cast is going to be very similar to this except for the wood profile from the staves that they used in the 46 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so i'm just have to run the calculator to see what exactly the proof is yeah 
It's funny, while you're doing that, when I was doing research for this and uh, seeing how, that people were mixing things to make Pappy on Reddit, a <laughs> user said, I hear if you mix Old Fitzgerald and Makers 46, it tastes like just shut the fuck up and get over this bullshit Pappy crap. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, Scott, it's 104.5 as the proof. Oh, okay. So it's only two and a half less it's than Pappy. Pretty close. So it's pretty damn close when you yeah. do it this way. I like this a lot. I don't know if it tastes anything like Pappy, but it's fucking good. It tingles in your tongue, this one. I, I tell you, we do it, and people get really mad at us. Like We're like purists. Like, <laughs> but you know what? You know, it's your whiskey. You Blenders, bought it. Blend, do what you want I mean, to it. People like Luxro and Barrel right, that's blend what all the time. So we have two whiskeys here that are finished products, but you put them together, and you make a third finished product. If the company did this, you'd be like, what a genius. You know what I mean? But because <laughs> I'm doing it, I'm an asshole. But listen, it doesn't always work. Trust me, no. it doesn't always work. No. There, but if it works, we keep it in the podcast. If it doesn't, we don't. Oh, sometimes we do. Well, sometimes we do. If it's really bad, then we're like, yeah. ew, what the fuck was that, Scott? Random belligerence. Self-loathing edition. Oh, my God. So it does, it adds a sweet finish to it. Yeah. That we didn't have with the Makers 46 by itself. So it absolutely tames out the oakiness. Yeah. So for the price of about, <laughs> oh, I don't know, $110, you can have both <laughs> these bottles and you can uh, play with it all you want. Yeah. I'm just going to look up the lowest Pappy expression on Wine Searcher to get the average price that it's paying. This, so this is the lowest okay. one that you can buy. This is Pappy two year. Pat, pa- <laughs> <laughs> Happy uh, the, the, the ten year. Oh my god! Average price old Rip Van Winkle ten year. Okay, that I got for a ten dollar pour in New Orleans five years ago. Mm-hmm. One thousand four hundred and thirty three dollars average, with sixteen hundred being the high. Wow! So if you get these two at a hundred dollars and mix them together right. at a close approximation of what we can remember what Pappy tastes like, why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. Anyone who's in there for the hunt or for the adventure or the experience of tasting Pappy or Stag or Weller, this isn't for you. You're on a different mission, and that's fine. I'm not criticizing you. Scott and I went to a tasting. We spent decent money to taste the Stag mm. and a Pappy 15 and, and one of the Wellers because we wanted that experience. We didn't have to. We felt in our role as podcasters of whiskey with them being so popular and talked about to have no frame of reference we were doing ourselves and our listeners a disservice so we did it so you could say hypocrite hypocrite (laughs) (laughs) so so that kind of leads into my last question that i have to close out our whiskey mentory on this for this year can we actually fix this we listed a bunch of ways that we could possibly fix it but will any of those ones be implemented and will they actually work Barring the people who are on their mission and the hunt, people who just are caught up in them feel like they're missing something, you know, and I've been part of that group. I've had to fight myself out of it. Mm. If you just relax and realize, you know, the mentality that Scott approaches whiskey, there's always something here to drink. Mm. We walk in a liquor store and if I go and like, ah, oh, they don't have any Henry Kenna, ah, oh, they don't have any Eagle Rare. He's like, but they have Russell Tenure. They have Rare Breed. Mm. They have... They've you know, full, foolproof Bartons. They got Knob Creek. They have dovetails here. They have. Oh, look, they got Journeyman. All right, kinds of expressions. Right. They got they got few. A few of those. Yeah, a few bourbon, few rye, and, and, <laughs> and their creative expressions. So so are you more optimistic than pessimistic about whether this Yeah, can be because fixed? I realized, I guess I feel like if there was a box of crayons and someone yelled, there's no red crayons anymore. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, well. All right, I guess I... I guess I have to use orange and yeah. brown. Yeah. <laughs> Mix them together. I guess I have to... be Right. You know, we've made a lot of suggestions. We've made some accusations. But if you're comfortable with your role in this, you know, if you're like, I'm searching to collect the entire NT collection, then good luck. They're out there. Go find them. You might have to overpay. But if mm. when they're on your shelf, if it makes you beam... Good for you. Yeah. I'm more pessimistic about whether we can actually fix this, whether there, any of these are really going to work. Like the bottle tech is really cool, but yeah. I feel like it's an arms race. Uh, every time that right. they try to do something to dissuade fraud, they move the goalposts. It's always, you know, give and take. Uh, I think people bear the biggest responsibility, yes. us, the consumers, for the just the reasons that you were just saying. And I think there are enough people who are selfish and hoarders and want to be flippers like that guy that I mentioned in that Whiskey Advocate, Paul, and the guy that you got online. Aaron. Aaron. 
I think there's enough of those people that they, they ruin it for everybody. I just feel really just right. down about it. Well, it's funny that you feel that way, Scott, because doing this whiskey entry kind of flipped me around. Mm. I felt more pessimistic when we started, but then at the end, as I'm <laughs> sitting here, I'm going, you know what? Bell Mead Reserve, right. Russell Tenure, right. Maker's Mark 46, all the barrel picks that I'm lucky to have from a tremendous store like Benash that I'm blessed to be near, right? So I just looked around and I said, you know what? I'm focusing on the negative and not the positive. Right. So yeah, I can't go buy a George T. Stag for $150 if I want it. I can't get Midwinter Night's Dram this year at a price I want to pay. Yeah. Oh, well, well, well. Fucking people have real problems. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> right. It's, this is first world problems. Right. It's like, it's like, I can't find a place to park my yacht. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, like Anders said, the local lounge has 200 plus American whiskeys to drink, but we don't have Pappy 23. Yeah. I think I was just living in a bit of ignorance because of the way that I approach the, the whiskey uh, industry and yeah. how I drink it, that I was ignoring all that. It was, I was ignoring the secondary market. I was drinking alternatives. I don't have favorites that I buy all the time. But this whiskeymentary has made me aware that all of that is happening, and mm -hmm. that's why I'm sort of pessimistic. So it's right. so funny that we had the opposite experience. Right, because I was deep in the secondary market, yeah. watching all my favorites disappear. And now you feel sort of like optimistic about the future and like that people can change this thing. Yeah. And I, I'm the opposite, where now I know all the problems that are happening, and I'm sort of pessimistic that we can actually correct them. I think when I tried and drank the Bell Mead Reserve and the Russell Single Barrel, which I'd never had before, I'm like, these two are great yeah well shit they're just two that we randomly picked there has to be another 50 more out there just from that standpoint the the whole thing that we've been hammering this entire three-part episode is yeah. just buy something else that's the best way that you have to combat the secondary market there's so much whiskey out there find something else that you love I think that says it all, Scott. For those of you that have listened to all three parts, we thank you so much for your support and your shared interest. A very topical topic. Yeah. And that uh, we will be striving to bring you something as interesting next year. Mm. Also, get set, because we're a month away from Whiskey Madness. Woohoo! Coming in March. Favorite time of year. 16 exciting whiskeys this year. Be on the lookout in the last week of February for our announcement show. We'll let you know what the format's going to be. Yep. I'm so excited about the brackets we're going to have. I'm telling you right now, tune in. And I'll say it again. If you don't taste stuff blind with your friends, you'll never know what whiskey you could actually be enjoying. Right. So for the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, I'm Ed. I'm Scott. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Cheers, everybody. Later.